know, folks, attitude in sports is so important. Attitude in life is so important. And the man on my screen, if you're watching on YouTube, is one of the smartest guys I know. I think the fact that he's South African certainly helps that. Mike Colley, welcome to the podcast. How are you, man? Uh, good to see you, Mark. All good, thank you. Yeah, listen, um, I've had the good fortune of getting to know you through this success cube. For the audio listeners, go check out on YouTube. You'll see what I'm talking about. Um, through Garth Milne, who's a well-respected instructor, trainer. And then we had a call one time, folks, and and Mike just blew me away with these candid, insightful observations about you know, how success really happens mentally and emotionally. So, Mike, I had to share you with the world kind of thing. So I'm so glad you would join us. Well, one thing I've never been called is is so um, exceptional, as you put it. So I hope I'm going to be able to live up to the hype here, Mark. <laughs> okay, well, before you live up to the hype, let's introduce you. Tell our global audience, Mike, a little bit about yeah. you. Yeah, Mark, I, I started out many years ago as a, as a school teacher. Um, absolutely loved it. The coaching side, the sport, obviously some different sports to what a large portion of your audience would be um, you know, watching uh, cricket, hockey, field mm -hmm. hockey, uh, and soccer or football with a round ball. Yeah. Uh, and I just loved it. Um, I was also a mad keen golfer from the age of 12, was always out on the course. And I realized long term that that wasn't going to be my, my end goal. Uh, I always had more month than I did money at the end of <laughs> the 30 days. Yeah, right. So I just moved into executive education, which I seem to have a knack for. Mm -hmm. um, and I spent 25 years there. And then a year or so ago, I got introduced to the cube. Um, I'd been fortunate. I'd played a high level of sport uh, from a hockey perspective. I played international sports. So I understood um, a little bit about what was happening in the late 80s, early 90s. We were start getting into the mental side of, of, of that and sport and you know how do you mac maximize your potential and your performance. Um, and that's always interested me. So when I came across the success cube, I was fascinated by this, this little um, six duplo blocks and, and the power that's contained within. And I started, basically stopped what I was doing um, in terms of the future thinking space and executive education. And, and I've gone full time into this. My, my passion is to see how can I get people to perform at a higher level than they, what they, they're currently doing. And that's something that I suppose it's a bit of the teaching me. It never leaves you. And that, that piece has stuck with me. I really get a, a kick out of seeing people take themselves to another level. Well, from one teacher to another, um, you know, folks, you're sitting in on essentially two educators talking about a concept that I think is largely misunderstood because when, you know, people talk about the mental game and that's, that's a subject into and of itself, but then you'll hear folks talk about, well, and you'll hear good golfers and elites athletes and stuff talk about, well, I got to have a good attitude and, you know, people are like, okay, but people really don't get attitude if you will. So what I did in preparation for this conversation, and I want to read it back to you. Um, I'm just going to open up the page here real fast. I went and found the dictionary definition for attitude. And there's two ways, uh, nouns. An attitude is a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something, typically one that is reflected in a person's behavior. And then another one here, Attitude is a position of the body proper to or implying an action or a mental state. And I was like, yeah. And then I thought about Mike and this future cube, which I want you to talk about, because at the bottom of success, for the folks watching, the cornerstone of all success is, that, is attitude. And I've seen it firsthand with your work with someone who's very close to me, how defining what attitude is and what attitudes one can take to whatever endeavor you're doing sort of almost can set the tone for the day, if that makes any sense to you? Yeah, no question. I, um, I think your attitude and the reason why we put attitude as the base of the cube is it's your foundation. Mm. Attitude is the one thing you can control um, totally. You have 100% control of your attitude. You don't have control with what happens to you, but you have control 
with how you respond to what happens to you. Yeah. So, you know, talking about you know having an attitude of being responsible, response able. I'm able to control my my response. Mm-hmm. So if if I'm going into a situation where it's a golf tournament or you know a pressure situation, I know that things are going to get tight. If I understand that I'm totally in charge of how I respond to the situation, it it makes things pretty clear in my mind. Um, and and what I encourage people to do is to have four three to four attitudes that resonate with them when they're doing certain things. Mm-hmm. And it could be responsible, it could be curious, it could be aware, and it could be uh, determined. Yeah, and well, that's in a golfing on. context. Yeah. When, once you're doing this, folks, I'm going to open up, uh, go check it out on YouTube. I'm going to open up here and I'm going to share the screen here. And I'm going to show you the list of attitudes that Mike shared with me. Uh, I've just got to get to the correct page here. Um, here we go. And first off, you know, when I thought about attitude, Mike, like you listed a few and then you said, well, when you go out there, um, you know, decide what attitude you're going to have. And for me, attitude was always something like kind of vague. It's like, well, I got to get a, have a good attitude. So I've got to be positive or I mustn't use bad language or, or something like that. But you've broken them down. I mean, you've got pages full of attitudes one can adopt. What, how many are there ish over here? There's or, 60. There should be about 60. 60. So there's 60 attitudes. Um, I, I want you, before we go into this, because you said, well, I can go out there with this attitude, that attitude, and that attitude. To me, that's almost kind of liberating because now I don't, it's like when someone says to a golfer, well, you've got to focus or you've got to concentrate. I find folks trying to concentrate as opposed to breaking it down to something that's actionable. Does that make sense? Sure it does. Uh, I think you've hit the nail on the head. You know, we often talk about have a great attitude. You know, you, as a coach of, of a group of players, you say, guys, I need you to have a great attitude. Now, if I'm talking to 12, 13, 17 players, there's most probably 17 different interpretations of, mm. of what, you know, in, in their various minds. So, you know, if I say uh, I'm going to be accountable and accountable means the following for me, it's everything's up to me. I'm not going to leave anything to chance. I'm going to own this. Um, if I'm going to make it happen, I'll do whatever it takes. When you as the coach talk to me about accountability, you know what my definition is, and I know what my definition is. So the moment you say to me, Mike, I'm not going to be joining you on this tournament, you need to be accountable from everything you do when you get on the plane to fly there to playing four rounds and flying home. So if I've chosen four or five of those attitudes that are going to be my key factors that are going to, I'm going to measure myself against over that tournament, and it could be accountable, it could be my awareness, curiosity, and determined. If I've got a very clear definition for each four of those, I'm going to measure myself consistently over the four days against those four. Mm-hmm. It's no, and what you have is a clarity of language. And clarity of language for you as a coach talking to me, me talking to you as the coach, or me talking to myself means there's no gray area. I'm now very clear that I'm going to do the following in terms of my behavior. I'm accountable, you know, determined, etc. So I put those four down and I'm going to, over the four days or the five days with practice, etc., I'm going to be totally engrossed in those attitudes. And I measure myself against them. I'm not then focusing on Am I going to win? Am I going to mm. make the cut? Am I going to come in the top 10? Because the moment we let our mind move out of the present, I'm, I'm pretty much taking myself out of the equation. And it allows me then to measure something that's not the golf shot I'm hitting. Because, you know, if I hit a, a bad golf shot, oh, you know, I can get emotional, I can react to it. But if I'm just working on scoring Uh, or evaluating my focus of each shot, I don't get attached to the outcome of the shot. Then straight away, I'm staying in the present. Sorry, Mark. No, no, I I interrupted. I I thought you were done there. Forgive me. Um, 
there is a certain sort of unshackling, a, a, a liberation, if you will, that comes with that because someone you work with, I was watching compete the other day and uh, the individual was in contention and I saw a bit of a rough start and it was said to me a little bit later, don't worry, I know what I'm doing. I, I was thinking more about the results than what I had was in terms of my controllables. And those controllables were like, what was my attitude going to be on each shot? And that attitude may have been like um, determined or resolute or whatever the case might be. And I was like, wow. And in a way that almost freed the individual up then from then on when that delineation was made and when it was realized that, hold on, I've moved away from attitudinal awareness to situational awareness. That's when the, uh, the, uh, the apple cart was sort of proverbially upset. Yeah. So specifically in, with the individual in question that you were chatting about there is what we said was evaluate your focus. So how focused are you in your, so when you're, you know, evaluate after each shot, your focus on your pre-shot, your shot and your post-shot routine. Mm -hmm. Don't worry where the ball goes. Just evaluate that. And the individual drifted away on day two a little bit for three or four holes and four holes and then realized straight away what was happening and, you know, um, and, and pulled back to, okay, it's just the, all you must do is evaluate my focus because if I am focused, invariably the shot, you know, I have the desired result. Um, it's, it's an interesting phenomena. It's, you know, you've often heard coaches say, okay, just free wheel and the players just perform, whether it's in an individual sport or a team sport. What we try to do is get people to relax, to play at the subconscious level that allows you to tap into your, your real genius. We often, when we're thinking past, present, or we've got uh, past, future, sorry, we, we often start, you know, placing a huge amount of pressure on ourselves about, I have to get a result. I have to do this. Yeah. When you're doing that, you're actually putting shackles on yourself. Whereas, you know, when, when we try and say, right, let's just focus on a couple of key attitudes that you're going to, that are going to fundamentally be your guiding light for your practice, your you know performance in tournaments. You're providing individuals and teams an opportunity to perform um, in an uninhibited way, and that's when we actually perform. Is yeah. is when we've got freedom. Well, that's let's, really where we want to get to. Well, let's do this. You've got all these different attitudes. You've touched on a few. But with each one, for the folks looking at the document, you can see there is essentially what is a definition of the attitude. I'd picked some, and then you, and I said to you, Mike, I want to talk about these, and you quickly said to me, folks, this was pre-recording, you're like, but wait a second, Mark, everyone's attitudes can be different. And, and I want to highlight that before we go into these, because in show business, this is kind of called a tease. So I want to tease some of them, go through the definition, have you described them? And in a way, I guess, sort of for the listeners and the viewers say, well, when you go and practice today or play tomorrow or whatever, adopt these or touch base with Mike so he can help you figure out what's necessary. So you touched on um, accountability, which I think is a must for everybody if you want to be successful. But then you said awareness that you wanted to talk about. Um, the definition, I'll, I'll read this back to you um, and then let you comment. It's a key trait for success, knowing one's strengths, weaknesses, and tendencies can help individuals capitalize on their strengths while also addressing areas for improvement. Additionally, being aware of one's emotions, thoughts, and behaviors can help individuals regulate themselves and respond appropriately in different situations. I talk about physical awareness in practice all the time because I feel like folks get on autopilot. You have hit the nail on the head here, in my opinion. So, yeah, you know, in terms of talking about the individual close to you that we, we're helping, mm -hmm. earlier today I had a, a great chat with them. And one of the things we were talking about was, you know, being aware of yourself, that self-awareness that on the beginning of day two, in contention, um, a little bit anxious, maybe starting to drift into the future and thinking about that. The key is the next time, 
that that individual gets in that situation, you are aware that it's happening and you're breaking, um, you've left the the state, you you know, the, the, the tension space you want to be in mm -hmm. and you've gone into a future mode. So, and, and that's what I talk about wisdom is, you know, you make that mistake once, but you don't do it again. So the individual in question played three or four holes, you know, badly. What we talk about at elite level golf is don't hit two bad shots in a row. Yeah. The whole idea was now be aware that um, I'm not focusing and I'm moving away from what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and you're aware after you've hit the first shot, not after the third hole, because some damage is done after three holes. So it's, it's that awareness. And maybe the awareness is also, um, you know, at the beginning of the final round, when you've got that that tight drive over the dog leg, that you're not feeling as confident as maybe you should be. Mm -hmm. So don't go for that, you know, cutting it over the dog leg, hit it to the middle of, of the fairway, lay it back 10, 20 yards, but still hit the green. Five, four or five holes later, you might have built some momentum, your confidence grows. And, and that's being aware. And, and that's what I often refer to as having an old head on young shoulders, yeah. where you see younger players have that ability. What it means is they've got the capacity to learn. And when they, they make a mistake once, they very seldom repeat that mistake. They will make other mistakes, and that's fine. But yeah. they so they don't make that sense. So they all they're doing is getting rid of the mistakes, and they're building up a bank of good experiences. You talk about old head on young shoulders. You know the modern day vernacular. Uh, I use it when I'm an on course announcer. Is we talk about a player having a a, a good golf IQ, and, and and the example there you share is so wise because. You, the average club golfer, they've got a 200 yards over water, whatever, and they've hit that shot one time and they try and do it anyway. Where the wise golfer, the golfer with a proper IQ, they will sitch it. They will analyze the situation. Like they wouldn't try that shot on Sunday, uh, Thursday morning of a tournament, but they'd certainly try it on a Sunday afternoon. That's just that, 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 that awareness you speak of. 100%. And, and it goes to the next, the, the next, uh, um, attitudinal trait there, curiosity. Yeah. And that's, I really want people to be curious. So when you've, you know, whether you're practicing or, or you're playing and you hit a particularly bad shot, most of us, if we're practicing, just put another ball straight away in and we, we try and hit it again and rectify it. Mm -hmm. I want the opposite to happen is step away and go, be curious. You know, we've, I'm talking about a, reasonable golfers to elite golfers there's no way your swing has just gone just left your your body it, it doesn't happen what's <laughs> happened is you've most probably drifted off and your mind started thinking about something else mm -hmm. and you've hit a bad shot and immediately what do we say to ourselves ah you know and we we curse and whatever and then we just pull a ball and try and rectify it thinking it's a technical error I yeah. would think that 99.5% of all the errors is you haven't got into your pre-shot routine, you're not following your process, and hence the things have, you know, things have gone awry. Yeah. So be curious because you want to pick it up after the first bad shot, not the fourth, because after the fourth bad shot, you're starting to question your swing and go on. And also if you're curious, and that's where the cube comes in, Mm -hmm. is it's unemotional. Yeah. If I had a really bad shot and I'm not curious, you know, I slam my club in the ground, throw the club in the bag, I storm off um, and I'm grumpy for 50, 60 yards. If I'm curious, I invariably am engaging a totally different part of my brain. I'm I'm thinking with my right side of my head, yeah, my brain, and mm -hmm. I'm starting saying, hey, what did I do? Straight away, my answer, I'm having a conversation with myself. And I'm not having a one-way uh, dialogue that's full of expletives and how bad I've just become, et cetera. Yeah. And you, you straight away, you're into problem-solving mode and it goes back to number one. I'm accountable. Mm -hmm. And before I know it, I'm, I'm building a little bit of momentum. Even though I might not be playing well, I can feel as though, hey, I can handle this.
Yeah, we recently had Victor Hovland on a podcast, and everything he he's, he speaks about the mental game a lot. I almost I think unbeknownst to himself, and this curiosity, I'll define it to what you've written here. It's the foundation for learning and growth. Successful individuals have the desire to explore new ideas, experiences, and perspectives. They ask questions, seek out information, and are open-minded to new possibilities. And I recall him using the term open-minded often in our conversation. Yeah. You just think about how he's rectified his short game. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was all about being curious and having, yeah, he found an individual that's most probably not your diehard run-of-the-mill um, teaching pro that's helped him get there. But he was open. He was curious. How can I take this part of my game, which is not up to the rest of my game, and you now look at him, He he's most probably in the top 10 without question yeah. from 100 yards in, whereas before, by his own admission, he was... You know, he, it was a weakness. Yeah. Okay. Another attitude. Um, you've heard the attitude of gratitude is a cliche. Uh, you talk about grateful being an attitude. And, and for me, this is a biggie because if you truly are grateful and thankful for the fact that, you know, on, you're on the golf course, even though stuff's going wrong, or you're grateful that you can play golf, even though stuff's going wrong, that sort of starts metabolic stuff within that, that, that helps. And so you define here, Gratitude is an important trait that helps individuals appreciate what they have and find meaning in their experience. Successful individuals are grateful for their success as well as the challenges. They recognize that setbacks can be opportunities for growth and learning. This sort of sounds trite. I mean, like, oh, yeah, I've heard this before. But I feel like there's real gold in grateful. So why don't you elaborate there, please? I think in today's world, particularly with the instant gratification and everything, you know, we're always looking at what don't we have. You know, I, I need this. I've got to go in search of that. Before we even go in search of that stuff, have a look at what we've got. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're talking in a golfing context, you've got the ability to go out there in good or bad weather with most probably people that you're quite close to and go and have four and a half, five hours of unbelievable experience where – you can enjoy nature, the company, and you can learn a hell of a lot about yourself and other people mm -hmm. and, and have a huge amount of fun. There are millions and millions of people that don't have that, you know, that opportunity. Um, and, and, and just being able to, to enjoy that time. And even if you don't play your best golf, it's still an experience to be enhanced. And the interesting thing for me, Mark, is a lot of the things we're talking about here in terms of the different attitudes, they, they're connected and they're interconnected. Yeah. When I say interconnected, there's an interdependence. So if I'm grateful, you know, it's interconnected that I'm most probably going to be respectful to my playing partners, to the rules of golf, to the etiquette of the game, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to be you know, honest and, and not honest about cheating, you know, placing my ball in the rough, honest about my assessment of how did I play. I'm likely to be more curious. And all of those things feed in to being able to be not only a better golfer, but just generally a better human being. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, a lot, even, you know, if we're speaking to a large group of elite young amateur golfers, what percentage of them are going to go on to be Victor Hovland, uh, you know, Tiger Woods, uh, yeah, etc.? Sure. It's a it's a very small percentage, but they're all going to most probably go on to be in business, have leadership positions, be parents, uh, maybe continue playing golf, do coaching, and all those kinds of things. And what we're really talking about here is making solid human beings, yeah. giving them a framework where they can uh, handle themselves in such a way that people look to them and say, you know, I want to, I, I want to copy that. Because most of our, you know, our early lives, and, and even as we get older, you, you look at people as role models and mm -hmm. you say, I want to imitate that. And, and we don't have enough of that because a large number of our role models are distinctly not what we want to see. <laughs> and I think, you know, have, having 
you know, these kind of attitudes allow you to, A, have a, a clear guide in where you want to go, but also using the cube, it gives you a, an opportunity to measure yourself. So I can constantly evaluate how am I performing against the criteria of the attitudes I set down based on goals I've set mm -hmm. and the work rate I've put in and the skills I've, you know, I've attained. And at that, this could apply to golf, sales, running my business, uh, you know, community, family. It's applicable to any, every area of our life. It really is. Um, there's one more I do want ahead of the 16 you reference. And again, I've got the cube here in my hand for the mm. viewers. Um, there was, there, there's, there's an attitude of respect and I'll define it. And then I'll tell you where I was wrong about my understanding of it. And I think it's spurned of my 20 something years as a college golf coach. And you write here, respect is a fundamental trait that underlies healthy relationships and collaborations. Successful individuals show respect to themselves and others. They value diversity. They treat others with kindness and empathy and recognize others' contributions. Now, when I thought of respect, and I use the term as a coach to a young player, I was like, you got to be respectful of the golf course. and You can't be you know, throwing tantrums and stuff and the people around. You know, I didn't, I guess, take it to the deeper level here that you do. And I'm interested in and you elaborating on this to to bring this back to golf because uh, i think there's also a lot that can be learned here yeah for me respect is key and i think you you, you know what you've just shared uh, as as how you approach respect is also pretty much how i was brought up and that could be a factor of our age as well as growing up in a uh, a country like south africa where it was you know respect your elders etc Where's what we're saying there is um, respect everything and respect other people be, because as as a coach, if I'm helping you, um, I'm I'm hopefully going to be honest and and curious etc. But I'm going to have empathy, and what I do want is to understand your opinion and where you're coming from, because if I can take where you're coming from share my ideas with you and listen to what you say and and build on that is a far greater chance of you being able to absorb what I'm talking about mm -hmm. and and putting it into what you're wanting to achieve as the player. It mm -hmm. mustn't be I'm Mark Immelman, you know, I'm a Hall of Famer, I'm a world-class teacher, so you have to do it my way. Mm -hmm. It's a case of, you know, Mark, I'm thinking about this and when I'm, you know, taking the club away, I'm feeling this, you know, absorbing that and saying, okay, that's what they're seeing and that's how they're doing. How can I share what I want them to do to get them into that perfect position so they can, can transition back to the ball? Yeah. And that's a case, you know, it, it's not just the respect. It's about being curious as well and saying, okay, if I say it to them that way, how will they respond? Let me try. And you have a go and they don't get it. So you say, cool, it's fine. Don't Let me try another way. And and you eventually find that that's what, you know, that second or third way triggers them and they get it and they go, wow. And, and I think that's a, a, a fundamental part of coaching because at the end of the day, what you're wanting to do, I think is certainly what I'm wanting to do is get these youngsters or any person I'm working with to a stage where they become self-reliant. Yeah. They don't need me. They might phone and ask for advice and say, yeah, I'm stuck. Fine. Let's chat. But it's a case of they get into a situation and they know how to get themselves out of it on their own because that, that builds that inner belief where when they know they get to that, you know, it's the last chance saloon and their backs against the door. They don't need to have hundreds of people telling them how good they are and how good they're being inside. They know I've got this. And yeah. those are the individuals that come through and it could be golf. It could be sales. It could be running a business. It could be saving a business. It's, it's all about um, having that inner belief and that inner belief comes from having lots of little successes 
um, and, 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 and that builds, you know, and you as a coach, you know, with respect and taking their ideas and molding them with yours, you invariably get someone that says, I want to go and practice. I want to hit balls at six o'clock in the morning. I'm, I want to be in the gym because the whole time I'm getting better. It was an interesting, I digress like before the Ryder Cup, there was a fantastic um, series on um, super sport, which is the, the main you know sports channel here in South Africa. Yeah. And they had the, build, the, the countdown to the Ryder Cup mm -hmm. and they had lots of, uh, focus on Luke Donald and Zach Johnson. And one of the, or in fact, three of the programs with, with Luke, they had his coach, uh, I think Pat Goss from Northwestern University. And when I was watching Pat talk about a young Luke Donald arriving over from the UK into, you know, Chicago and North America, you know, the USA, the big USA, coming from his little town in the UK and what landed up as the Ryder Cup captain, Pat Goss has had a monumental impact on Luke Donald's life, far wider than golf, because what the way Pat spoke and the way he conducted himself was Luke Donald's just a little Pat Goss. Yeah. And, and it's like he, he's been a mentor to him, not only on his golf swing for 20 years, but the way he, the way he engages with people and how he listens, it was watching a little mirror image of Pat Goss when Luke Donald operates. And for me, you know, I remember just after Luke Donald's dad died, he was interviewed, and he said, "I don't care about being world number one." He said, "My old man, you always used to say to me, are you going to be someone that people can be proud of, and your dad will be proud of you?'" And you know, for and that was the top golfer in the world. So golf. Yes, it's important, but this other stuff allows you to get into those situations. And I think if you understand the attitudes and you understand clearly where you want to go and how you're going to get there and you measure yourself, you've got such a good chance of getting there. Don't make the end goal the be-all and the end-all. It's the journey that counts because when you get there, if, if the, only the end point is being the focus, you won't enjoy it. Folks, uh, I've known Mike Colley for a few months now. Uh, he's speaking into my soul. I'm sure he is yours too. Um, uh, how's the shoulder feeling and, uh, or the, the arm? Uh, I see you in the sling there. You're doing better? Uh, well, we, we're three weeks from post-op, so I've got another three weeks in the sling and then another 22 on rehab. So we're getting there. Yeah, but it's not the first, so I've had the other one done, so it'll, I'll know what I'm in for. <laughs> um a large part of this, and I want you to kiss this just real quickly before I let you go. Um, the success cube for the folks who haven't listened to the podcast with Garth Milne, it's six Duplo Lego blocks ostensibly. It's there's attitude at the base, there's work rate through the middle, and then there's skills at the top. And you use this as a non-confrontational way for teachers, students, students just by themselves to analyze how they did on a day at work, on the practice tee, wherever they are. Um, talk a little bit about this real fast and tell folks where they can get it, please. Sure. So, you know, Charlie Mungal, Warren Buffett's lifelong business partner, talks about success, and his success is not difficult. He said, continue doing what you're doing that's working. Stop what you're doing that's not working. And... The key thing is, he said, people get distracted. So they set goals, they put an action plan, and then they get distracted. What the cube is designed to do is for you to look at various areas of your life and to set goals. Mm -hmm. Once you've set the goals, you need to look at what are the attitudinal traits and choose them from that sheet you, you shared earlier with the audience. Yeah. What are the four or five attitudinal traits I need for me best, giving me the best chance to achieve those, um, you know, that particular goal. And the attitudes might change depending on what area I'm focusing on. Then I look at my work rate. How much work do I need to put in to go in search of achieving that goal? Mm -hmm. And then you assess your skills. Do I have the skills? Do I need to improve those skills? Or do I need to improve those skills as well as acquire other skills? And then 
you you forget the long-term goal. All you do is focus on skills, attitude, and work rate. And you evaluate yourself. So it could be a practice session. It could be at the end of a week. Um, it depends on the individual. I wouldn't leave it longer than three or four days. Yeah. And the whole idea is then to use the cube to score yourself and to see how I'm performing against the criteria I have set. Yeah. So these are my goals. Mm -hmm. And if you were coaching me, you and I would do this so you would know my goals as well as myself. So you could build your cube, you could build a cube representing my performance, mm -hmm. and I would build a cube. And then our two cubes are different. And you say, as the coach, Mike, I've got this as your, this doesn't, you know, your your attitude maybe hasn't been there from my perception. So there's a starting point for a really interesting conversation. Yeah. I could do it on myself. And that's what I constantly do. So I would, so now with my rehabil rehabilitation, I see, you know, how's my attitude? Am I doing it? Am I doing it consistently? Checking the work rate against what the physio has given me, et cetera. And what it does is it gives me feedback. And what people don't understand is 30, 33% of our brain is wired to our fingertips. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I see a cube that's not a perfect cube, and I start looking at it and seeing my attitudes at 40 or 50%, my work rates at 75 and my skills are at 50. Straight away, I'm not having a go at me. I'm like, oh, Mark, you're doing this badly. You, you know, you map it. What about this? What about that? I'm looking and saying, okay, how can I make this a stronger structure? How can I make this closer to representing a cube? What's wrong with my attitude? I put it down as four, curious, determined, et cetera, and I evaluate. Maybe I need to take one of those out that's not working, put another one in. Maybe I need to up my work rate. So, you know, if I'm chipping from 40 yards and in, you know, I'm doing it for two hours a week and I want to get my, my handicap back down to scratch, I want to, I need to do it for four hours a week. Yeah. And I'm constantly getting feedback. Now, in golf, the large percentage of the time, what people use as the feedback is their score. No, I was just thinking. I mean, all, all of the all of a sudden, our global tribe folks doing this, folks subscribing to what you have to say, they may get to a place, and I've seen this happen, where the score is not necessarily who they are. Um, they grading how they went by how they how they graded themselves with their attitude, their work rate, and their skills. And, and that's exactly what we we wanted to do with that individual in question we were, were chatting about earlier. We don't want them to measure it on the score. You take care of focusing on your pre and post shot routine and evaluate your focus. The score will take care of itself. And, you know, you often hear really good golfers come off the course, top players, and people would say, you know, um, you had a fantastic round out there. And they say, yeah, I wasn't aware, that, you know, I wasn't aware of my score. Mm -hmm. The reason they weren't aware of the score is, yes, they might be scoring it, you know, putting it on the card, you know, keeping a log of it after each hole. But they are so into their process. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it on each shot. What happens, score just takes care of itself. Yeah. And, 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 and that's where the freedom comes because now we often get caught. You know, you double drop on the first and you drop on the third and you're playing or four. You go, my God, I've got 16 holes to go and I can only drop one more shot. That kind of thinking is only sending you one way. You know, and, and it's it's not positive. It's no, you start, you're putting the, the shackles. <laughs> exactly. You're putting the shackles. You're getting tense. Mm -hmm. Whereas you say, right, I've dropped three. Let me just... Focus on my pre-shot routine or focus on something that, that you know works and you just hit ball, find ball, hit ball, and watch what happens. So simple yet you so know, profound, Mike. Thank you yeah. for your time. Uh, please tell folks where they can find the cube, where they can find more from you. They can work with you if they wish. Uh, direct folks, please. Yeah. So my email is mike at futurerelevance.com. Uh, and that is one word. 
And the website is uh, www.futurerelevance.com. And if you've got any questions, just pop me a mail um, and I'll be happy to help. You know, I get, I think I get more of a kick out of this than the people I'm working with when I, you know, when things work, because it's, it's that old teacher me. Nothing makes me get out of bed with more bounce than, than being able to take people to another level. It's something that really gives me a huge buzz. You're changing the world one block at a time. I appreciate <laughs> Mark, thank you very much for, for inviting me. Appreciate it.